So welcome to September's second Thursday lecture series. My name is Sarah Lowenberg and I'm the manager of education at the Louisiana State Museum. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you all in this virtual setting to Friends of the Cabildo's second Thursday lecture with Sandy Rosenthal, um, who will be speaking about her recent book, Words Whispered in Water, Why the Levees Broke in Hurricane Katrina, which is of course an incredibly timely conversation as we've just passed the 15th anniversary of the storm um, and our state has just been rocked by another major hurricane. Um, and we continue to deal with, with the challenges of flooding and living with water in this city. Um, Sandy is joining us from San Francisco today, but is a New Orleanian um, and, an, and a civic activist and founder of levees.org. So she's worked with the museum much in the past um, in connection with our Katrina exhibition. Um, and the organization levies.org is dedicated to educating the American public about levy failures and flooding in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Recently, she was awarded the Outstanding Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award from Tulane University for these efforts. Um, and we're thrilled to have you here in this virtual setting this evening to share more about your recent book and project. Um, to give you all a heads up and do a little housekeeping as well, um, I will ask that you mute yourself during the program since often the, the sounds can compete. I may just mute you um, for you. Um, don't take it personally, it's just how Zoom works. Um, but we also encourage you to ask questions and, and comments and utilize like that. The, the chat function if you have questions along the way, and I will be sure to call those out and make sure that we see them. Um, and we'll have time for more questions and answers at the end of the program. So with that, I will turn it over to Sandy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here in smoky San Francisco. I'm going to share with you a photograph that I took crossing the Bay Bridge from Oakland. Uh, to San Francisco, the sky, you would just not believe it. Uh, the orange sky, um, it, it's quite frightening. Uh, the orange sky actually, though, protected the people of San Francisco from the toxins and the poisons in the atmosphere. Um, it's something about the layers and the inversions. And actually, the air quality yesterday, orange day, was very good. Today, looking out the window, it looked like a normal San Francisco day, misty, chilly and um but the air quality is so bad we can't go out uh but at, unless you're extremely healthy but anyone over 60 like myself shouldn't go out uh, my four-year-old granddaughter can't go out that's why i'm here and um and my pregnant daughter can't go out so it's it's really very frightening and uh and uh and that's a whole nother conversation on why we're having such extreme weather events. That's a whole, lots of conversations we can be having. But for the next few minutes, we will be talking about why the levees broke during Hurricane Katrina 15 years ago. And I'm going to show a very, very short little PowerPoint just to kind of get the conversation rolling. And then I, what I'm looking forward to most is the questions. I always feel like that's the best part of, of any conversation is, is the Q and A. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my PowerPoint now. I will have to put my glasses on if I want to see. Okay, whoops, I, that, that's not, not the beginning. Let me get back to the beginning. Sorry. Okay. Words whispered in water, why the levees broke during Hurricane Katrina. I was inspired by a sociologist uh, after the levees broke. And a, the sociologist, her name is Gay Tuchman, uh, impressed upon me how important it is to always look behind words that attribute calamity to wind and water. Because human beings are almost always, always hiding behind those words. And I decided to name uh, my book on those thoughts. So to, uh, and my publisher actually let me keep the title. Uh, she did 
want to put why the levee's broke during Hurricane Katrina. In my book, I don't ever use the word Katrina, not even once, not even once, because I was trying to get across the point that the flooding was not due to a hurricane. It was due to the, the mistakes of men. And my publisher insisted that it be on the cover. And I thought, well, if you're going to call out a myth, you need to call, out it, you need to call it by name once. And that one time is on the cover. So after the levee breach event disaster in 2005, the Army Corps of Engineers blamed the hurricane. Words whispered in water. Uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers refused to answer any questions about why the levees failed until all the preliminary tests were done. And that would be June of 2006. We realized that's nine months. For nine months, the Army Corps refused to answer questions. I'm gonna ask um, Sarah, am I too loud, too soft? Um, how is my volume? Is that okay? Um, I can hear you well. If others disagree or agree, feel free to use the chat, but I think you're good. I'm born profoundly deaf and sometimes I talk too loud. So if, 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 if uh, can you see a reaction from everybody? Okay. We, it sounds up. like, sounds good, says the okay. chat, so you're good to go. Thank, Thank you, you for that feedback. Now, it's now is a good time to feedback. Okay. So here, the Army Corps refused to answer questions. Meanwhile, here we are in the weeks after the disaster, and the entire world saw what happened to the people of New Orleans. And the entire world wanted to know what happened. And, and it's human, they don't wanna wait. They wanna know now. What happened? Why did we have such a horrible disaster? Well, this is a very critical time in history. The American people and Congress are engaged and focused and listening at this point. Meanwhile, the Army Corps refused to answer the question. So there were three reasons for the catastrophic flooding in those early days, weeks, and months. Monster storm, city below the sea, and all that local corruption. You know, they're all corrupt down there. Those were the, uh, the talking points being put into everybody's head nationwide and probably throughout the country. And it was also believable. I mean, this is the Army Corps of Engineers who's supposed to design and build the levees. This is the federal organization that has been building levees along the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio River, and had been in charge for 200 years with a sterling reputation. I mean, look at these levees. These levees are designed to hold back um, water for every single year for a surge height of up to 20 feet for 30 days or more. So who would have thought the Army Corps of Engineers can't build a few miles of drainage canals in New Orleans that only needed to hold water once in a while, not every year, and only for a few hours? It couldn't be the Army Corps of Engineers. So I was in a very unusual place for uh, when the levees broke. My husband told me to pack for three weeks. Three weeks, he said. He had been here for Betsy. He saw that... Um, the, where the direction that the storm was coming. Do you remember what he went through with Betsy? Um, no phone for six weeks, no air conditioning for a month. He said, pack for three weeks, and I did. And uh, so not only uh, did I pack for three weeks, I um, also, um, my house didn't flood, my husband's business didn't flood, my son's school, I only had one child in school at the time, didn't flood. So I was in a relatively secure, stable place for, for lack of a better word, to watch the disaster unfold and then to watch the response. And for me, the big breakthrough was just four weeks after the, uh, after the flooding, a September 28, 2000 report, uh, 2005 report. It said in big letters, the Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for project design and construction and local interests are responsible for maintenance of levees and flood control. Well, that looks pretty clear to me that the responsibility should lie with the designer, the contractor, and the builder, not the janitor. Keep in mind that the worst levee breaches, the ones that did the most damage, were the 17th Street and the London and the Industrial Canal um, completed in 2000, the newest levees, the newest um, levees, yes, and flood walls. So 
I founded the grassroots group, Leverage.org. And not, I didn't just shout, I asked a lot of questions. And the more questions I asked, uh, the more I found. And, and, and the group, obviously, not me alone. Nothing important gets done alone. And I got, me and my group got immediate pushback from the US Army Corps of Engineers, from the engineering establishment, from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and also from engineering professors at local universities. And this began to reinforce my belief, which became in time a certainty, that the US Army Corps was to blame and that had allied, allied themselves with the engineering establishment to rewrite history. So that hardly a single person in New Orleans doesn't remember Levy Spin 101. This is when my organization worked with a group of high school kids at Newman and we put together a one minute spoof of the Army Corps of Engineers cozy relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it, uh, it got was on every major TV and radio station uh, around uh, and that was in 2007. Well, the American Society of Civil Engineers did not enjoy that criticism and sent us a cease and desist letter that basically says, um, you know, I've circled it here. Uh, if you ignore this letter telling you to stop, we will um, take legal action. And what that means is they'll sue us, okay? And it, it uh, so that is, it, they, uh, again, the ASCE did not enjoy that criticism. And what levy.org did is uh, we got pro bono uh, representation from the local law firm Adams and Reese and also the Silicon Valley law firm Cooley and together those two major law firms uh, stood by levy.org and we dared the American Society of Civil Engineers to go ahead and sue us. Well the society withdrew that threat and we had made this announcement in a very well attended press event so that was in 2007 and, and throughout the next three years Levy.org put historic plaques in the ground. We pushed for federal reform of the Army Corps of Engineers. And we also caught the Army Corps of Engineers disparaging me and my group online out of the Army Corps of Engineers main headquarters, which was a very embarrassing event uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers. That was in 2008. So, so these things went on for some time. Uh, Levy.org was focused on getting the word out that the people of New Orleans are not to blame. The people of New Orleans were characterized as irresponsible and a burden to the nation. And, and I couldn't live with that. And the group Levy.org was focused on turning that belief around. Well, in 2011, on the suggestion of an advisor, Levy.org nominated two levy breach sites to the prestigious National Register of Historic Preservation because the historic breach event changed America as we know it. And this is important because 62% of the American population lives in counties protected by levees. Nearly two thirds of the American population lives by levees. So the big, big picture became very clear very quickly with all that research I did. Uh, I was forced to read all the reports that had come out later, 2008 and 2009, uh, I discovered information buried deep in those reports that was left out of the executive summaries. So moral of the story, don't read just the executive summary. And I found information that even experts Ivor Van Heerden and John Barry were surprised to hear. And the big picture became even more clear that the Army Corps of Engineers is singularly at fault for the flooding. Not the storm, not the geography of the city, and certainly not any imagined local corruption. So, but by 2011, the fairy tale narrative was still very firmly in the heads of not just the nation, but New Orleanians too. So, at me, oh, meanwhile, I also had a lot of detractors. My dog was on my side, but there were paid trolls, my forums at NOLA.com. There were bloggers with the American Society of Civil Engineers still attacking me everywhere I went. We had Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who had um, won those awards, putting out that bad, wrong information, and they were uh, going after me as well. Published authors, published academics, um, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them were um, taking sides against the work of levies.org. So they, one day in 2013, I realized that all of all of the detractors were all saying the same thing. They were all singing a conclusion from the number one first initial 2006 report that came out in June, June uh, 
no, May 22nd, 2006. It was the first report. Now, to be fair, it was the first report. And by definition, it was published without access to any other report. It was published without access to critical data. It was published on a shoestring budget and under a ridiculous deadline, okay? To be fair to these folks at the University of California, Berkeley. But their conclusion, I'm getting a little message here, hold on. Okay. Okay. Hmm, I'm, my, uh, my, uh, power, okay, I couldn't advance my PowerPoint for just a moment there. Okay, the, the conclusion of that Berkeley report was wrong. The conclusion was that the Army Corps of Engineers had tried for years to get authorization to install flood case that could be closed. That would have been the superior technical solution. But dysfunctional interaction between local interests prevented installation of those gates, except for one thing. It, it was false. It was false. The, 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 none of it's true. The, not even a kernel of truth in it. So what do you do about this fairy tale? Here we are with, in 2013. So um, my organization went to the doctors, uh, Dr. Um, Bob B., Ray Seed, and uh, Dave Rogers, and we brought our concerns to them and they they understood that what had happened they understood that they had been given wrong information and they agreed and offered to write a whole new report and they did and this new report is in water policy the official journal of the world water council and it retracted the wrong conclusion and replaced it with the right one which is namely the Corps made a tragic mistake when they misinterpreted the result of their large-scale e99 study that they had conducted in the 80s steel sheet pilings anchoring the flood walls were too short after that article um, debut and and after it was published in the New York Times the all major media stopped promoting that fairy tale that I just mentioned to you and my book, Words Whispered in Water, um, is a little bit longer version of what I just told you, with 260 pages with, with 500 footnotes. But my book is a longer version of what I just explained. And also, it, it talks about my personal story uh, as I fought for the people of New Orleans who, who deserved to throw off that cloak of shame that they were forced to wear for 10 years. So um, this is the view. I wanted to close. Thank you from smoky San Francisco Bay. This is the view from the dashboard of our rental vehicle as we drove from Oakland to San Francisco yesterday. And it doesn't do the sky justice. It was orange. The sky was orange yesterday. So with that, yeah, I'm so glad this part's over because I'm looking forward to uh, the questions that I that I hope to that I hope be able that I hope I be, have no problem 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 hearing them. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a reminder that if you have questions, please utilize the chat function. Um, I have one to kick us off. I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to how this um, change in information, um, or not change in information, but that this new information coming to light and our change of understanding of the floods um, might change our approach to future flooding. How can we take that information and prepare what changes need to be made to um, our approach to preventing future flooding? The, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, 62% uh, of the American population lives in counties protected by levees. Where I am in California, there are more people in California in danger of levee failure than Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi put together. And I think that the number one thing that uh, the people of this nation should understand that they too are protected by levees and you don't have to be at sea level to be protected. Some of our worst disasters were in the mountains or, or in Michigan or in uh, Iowa, Cedar, Cedar Rapids is getting a lot, of, a lot of flooding. So the way you do it is you pay attention and you ask a question. One of the things I've learned is it doesn't take an army to ask a good question of your local state or, or federal officials. You don't need an army. One person has the power to submit a, a request under the Freedom of Information Act. It's, it's, and I, I've asked um, so many I've, um, public records requests or requests under the Freedom of Information Act. I've asked for so many, I've actually lost count. And all you have to do is type an email, 
say who you are, um, say that I'm really me, I'm really Sandy Rosenthal, I'm really Mary Smith, and, and oh, by the way, if this is an expensive request, I'll be willing to pay, pay for it, and it never happens. And in all my requests, I've never had to pay anything. So uh, the power is asking a question and not giving up until you get an answer, okay? That's great, that's a great advice. Um, so we got some good questions in the chat. The first um, from Jordan, how deep were the levee walls buried? Um, that okay. We've heard that they were only a few inches deep. Right, that's a great question. I, I tried to keep my PowerPoint on, on the short side. Uh, the original um, guideline by the Army Corps of Engineers for those flood walls was between 42 and 65 feet. What happened is in 1982, the Army Corps of Engineers was behind schedule and the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, basically took the court of the woodshed and gave them a whooping, a, a verbal whooping, and said, you're behind schedule, get to work. And so now the Army Corps is behind schedule. The cost of steel is rising. Steel is very expensive, and it's very expensive to drive it deep into the ground. So they conducted that E99 test that I mentioned and wrongly concluded that they only needed to drive the sheet piling down 16 feet. Anything more than 16 feet was a waste of steel and, and equals a waste of money. The Army Corps of Engineers saved 100 million um, with that decision. And I don't think I need to tell you the cost that came with that $100 million savings. So that's the specific answer to that question. So, um Another question from Barbara, is everything okay now? Are we properly protected? Uh, okay, well, okay that's, that's a great question. It's a fair question. Uh, the one thing that the Army Corps did do properly, uh, and I I'm, and I'm, don't give out praise easily, is they did address the biggest problems. They addressed the big problem of water coming in through Lake Bourne to the, uh, to the east. They did address the problem of water coming in through Lake Pontchartrain into our drainage canals. Uh, they did address the, um, the, big, the big problem, but they've also um, taken a step further and they've made pretty darn sure that these levees don't break again. Uh, they could overtop, it, it is possible they could overtop, but we've lived with overtopping before. We've lived with, um, well, that's not really true. We haven't lived with overtopping levees, but we've lived with um, street flooding from the sewage and water board failing us or from, uh, the, from there just being too much water, um, that even if all the pumps were working, there still would have been flooding, which is what happened in 1994. So what we've done, so that's called inconvenient flooding, and we know how to handle inconvenient flooding. We move our cars. We, uh, um, you know, put our cars out of home way. We, 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 we check and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, we don't just sleep for eight hours and not look out the window and see if it's flooding. We know how to deal with with what's called inconvenient flooding. However, that you will not find a single expert, including myself, who believed that we have the appropriate flood protection for a major city with all the people, property, and infrastructure that we have here in New Orleans. We have something called 100 year protection, which is the same protection that, um, no offense to St. Bernard Parish, but that's the exact same protection that St. Bernard Parish has which has a fraction of the people, property, and infrastructure. That was a political decision. Uh, it was not an economic decision. And uh, bottom line, the Army, I mean, bottom line, the, uh, the main basin of the city of New Orleans should have at least 500 year protection or even a thousand year protection, which does not cost that much more. It wasn't an economic decision. As I said, it was a political decision. Nonetheless, the system that we have in place now is much better than we had 15 years ago. It's reassuring. <laughs> um, the next question from Jean, um, how did you get interested in this issue? Were you living in New Orleans at the time? Okay. Um, when the levees broke, I didn't even know where the levees were. Uh, I, I knew that there was a bike path on the Mississippi River levee, and that's really the only levee that I ever paid any attention to. So when the levees, and which by the way, is normal. We shouldn't need to know where the levees are we shouldn't need to know what they're made of or what they're built of. I mean, when you drive across, for example, when you drive across a, uh, a federal highway uh, on the interstate and you drive across a bridge, you, do you worry the bridge is gonna hold? Of course not. So 
So like, like other New Orleanians, I, I didn't know where the levees were. Well, I never really thought about them. After the levees broke, um, and uh, keep in mind, I was in a, that relatively secure space because I packed for three weeks and because I didn't flood. Um, I was um, out and about and on, uh, right around Halloween, I was playing tennis. I actually brought my tennis gear with me when I evacuated. That's how much I brought with me when I evacuated. And uh, I was playing tennis at the University of, Laf University of Louisiana in Lafayette. And um, my tennis opponent uh, was asking me, you know, why I was, I was from New Orleans, what am I doing in Lafayette? I told him I'm an evacuee uh, due to the levee failures. And I started to give him my little speech about why the levees broke. Well, he told me I was wrong. Katrina was a huge storm and that I didn't deserve any help and assistance because it was my fault for living there. I was mad. I got really, really mad. And I went and got my keys out of my tennis bag. I held up my keys and said, I am a victim. If you don't apologize right now, I'm leaving. And had I left, it would have been a major thing because I was part of a tournament, of a round robin tournament. And he said, I'm sorry, but, the, but my eyes were opened. So he, he, in my book, I call him the face of the monster that the Army Corps had created. Uh, he was one of the millions of people who were fooled by the Army Corps and their, their campaign to fool the American public. And so, but it's a good thing I met him. It's a good thing that I had that conversation with him because I may never have, I may never have founded the group levy.org and I certainly wouldn't have ever written a book about this guy uh, with this guy and the beginning of the chapter. By the way, I don't know his name. I'd love to know who it was. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's these little conversations that spark so much more. Um, the next question from Jordan, what are your thoughts on Ray Nagin? On what? Ray Nagin, our former Ray Nagin. mayor. Well, no one would have known who he was if the levees hadn't have broken. Uh, no one would have known who Michael Brown was if the levees hadn't broken. No, no one would know any of the, no one would know who I was if the levees hadn't have broken. Um, on, I, on the other hand, I'm not changing the subject. Uh, I have so many more friends. My, my life is richer in so many ways um, because of, of the breaking of the levees. I've met so many people that I would never would have met. But getting back to Ray Nagin, uh, I, I, I do applaud him for getting mad when the cavalry didn't come until Friday, the levees broke Monday, and I applaud him for letting his anger show because uh, I felt that same anger myself in a different way. Um, so, if, if the answer, so, so I applaud what he did on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, after the levee broke, two or three days after the levee broke, because I think him losing his temper on national on radio and having it be broadcast nationally may have may have helped us. That may have been what brought us uh, Lieutenant General Russell Honore. So I hope that's a good enough answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, this is a comment, but I'm going to read it out because it's an interesting okay. comment. Um, maybe it's because. As Detroiters, we long ago learned not to distrust what government agencies say about their own work. But I recall that as soon as the levees broke, both New Orleans residents and many of us around the nation knew or strongly suspected that this was a failure of the Army Corps of Engineers building at the levees. So perhaps some believed the fairy tales, but many never did. An interesting point about people's um, ongoing relationships to their government um, and how that, that also might affect how people interpreted what was happening. Um, and the next question from Anthony. Anthony, um, how do you think your organization has helped in making these past events come to the forefront with government entities so as to ensure that these type of events hopefully do not happen in the future? And then he said, oh, by the way, I well, really enjoy your book. I definitely, um, I have two purposes in writing Words Whispered and Water. One is, not enough people know the real reason the levees broke. Uh, we know in New Orleans, but not enough. So it's written more from a national perspective than local. But I also hope to inspire, because I believe that if I, who knew nothing about levees, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a civil engineer, uh, I, I don't, didn't have particular interest in politics, 
but I learned all of these things uh, by the seat of my pants uh, as I work with the organization. And I really do believe that if, if I could do this, I really feel that anyone, if they see a wrong, that they have the power within them to write it. That's beautiful. Um, uh, Karen also commented, thank you for detailing all the evidence and reports over so many years. It really has been a long process. Um, so um, there's still some time for questions or comments if people want to continue asking or unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, I'm going to give a pause. Oh, here we go. Yep. Um, from Regina, um, have you by any chance visited the Presbyterian Museum's exhibit about Katrina and what do you think of the exhibit? The, in, the, uh, in the Presbyterian, yeah, with the blue hands hanging from the ceiling when you walk in. That, that exhibit? Yes, yeah. um, the blue hands are not there anymore, but that exhibit, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely, I've, I've visited the exhibit. It, it, it's fantastic. Um, I've, I've visited it at least twice. Um, I, I was there the day it opened, and I, no, I've, at least three times I've been there. I, and I also feel that, the, in my opinion, the civil engineering exhibit, which was uh, over curated or overseen by uh, Luke Aronson, Luke Aronson, extremely well done, extremely well done. Uh, the only thing is I think that the engineering exhibit should be highlighted a little more because as I said, Katrina was an engineering failure. Um, and I, in my opinion, I feel that that exhibit needs to be made a little bit more um, central for lack of a better word, but the exhibit itself is, is, is flawless, you know, in, in its messaging uh, and, and what it communicates, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. I'm biased, but uh, it's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, a question says, what are you doing with your life at this time? Okay. Well, I spend a lot of time with my granddaughter um, and less time lately because of COVID um, and, and the, uh, these, these conditions here now, but I spend a lot of time with my granddaughter. But, um, and I also, uh, I'm still working on getting the Flooded House Museum on the National Register of Historic Places. I still lead um, an annual bike ride, uh, which I will be doing now that we're in phase three, and I think I'll be able to do a bike ride of the levee breaches. I would like to, to get that going again. But what I'm most excited about is helping other people who see a wrong and who are experts and see something, but don't have the tools, the two sets of tools you need. One of the sets of tools you need is how to be heard. I think of, think of life as a giant cornfield, and if you can just raise up just a little bit more than everybody else, you'll get seen and heard. It doesn't take much, but you gotta know how to do it. So you need a little bag of tricks to get seen and heard. And the other thing you need is a bag of tricks to protect yourself from the abuse and the harassment that is going to come if you're trying to change something for the better, okay? So that's what I've been having the most fun with. Um, I've uh, done a lot of um, assistance with a, a, an expert gentleman um, two years ago with his cause, and I'm currently working with somebody else with her cause. Um, I can't tell you about the current one because it hasn't come out yet, but to me, those are just, just the most uplifting, empowering, and, and worthwhile and meaningful things for me to spend my time with. And if I may say, it's even kind of fun for me. It's kind of fun to help someone when it's not my cause. The, 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 the weight on my shoulders is a little less heavy when it's somebody else's cause. Yeah, absolutely. This is a related <laughs> question, but where do you see levies.org moving forward to from here? Yeah, that's so interesting question. When I started the group levy.org, I had no idea it would be going on 15 years later. I had this idea, I'll get this little group going and we'll do our little thing and then we'll be done and we'll move on. And, and here it is, 2020, and it is far from over. I mean, the work of levy.org continues. Um, the, the Army Corps of Engineers for, for years and continues to give me um, on a silver platter, things to, to get upset about and things to talk about. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has gotten better, um, but there's, there's always things happening that, as, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't take an army 
to, to, to ask a question and go, wait, wait a minute, excuse me? I'm gonna give you an example, uh, if we have time. Okay, and and um, I'm, sure my, I'm sure many of you, or all of you remember, uh, Michigan, in Michigan in May of this year, two dams broke, two big dams broke in uh, a rain. And uh, uh, miraculously, there wasn't a lot of death, but about, oh, I don't know, uh, 100 homes, 150 homes had to be evacuated. Well. Um, so I'm paying attention to, the, to this, of course, I was. I mean, it's COVID, what else are we doing? So we're, I'm watching the news and uh, I noticed that the, the uh, dam safety committee, the DAM safety committee asked the owner of the dam to conduct an independent investigation. So I um, went to my levy.org blog and I typed up a, I typed up a blog, this is crazy. Um, you, you don't investigate your own work. And not only that, this is deja vu, because in 2005, uh, Congress ordered the Army, Army Corps of Engineers to investigate their own work. And that was called the Interagency Performance Evaluation Task Force. 15 years ago, the uh, Congress told the Corps to investigate its own work, levy.org screen blue murder. 15 years later, uh, the, uh, the Dam Safety Committee did the same thing, but this time, um, the dam safety committee recanted and they got an independent investigation going. And I am certain it was the levy.org blog uh, raising Kane about it that, that made that happen. So my point is it doesn't take an army. It, it, it can take one person asking a good question and demanding an answer and keep asking until you get an answer to it. That's great. And we've got a comment. Great work. Um, a question from Molly. Can you talk about your work on the flooded house museum, how you got the house and how, and what you hope to accomplish with it? Okay. Um, as we speak, you know, memories are fading and um, our children's children need to understand what it was like when the levees broke. And I have this vivid memory, like most people in the world, of the crazy, crazy slanted steel beams after 9-11, when 9-11, when the Twin Towers fell and those beams were stuck in the ground. And everyone assumed those beams would become part of a memorial. And one by one, they were cut down. One by one, they were carted away for search and rescue for the investigation. And no one thought they should be preserved. So fast forward to 2013, um, I was watching homes being put back into commerce and put back into put back home being put back into housing stock. And I thought, how will we be able to remember uh, the event and what it felt like to people. And so in 2013, my organization purchased what may have been the last flooded house that was still vacant right by a levee breach with the goal of preserving the house and preserving the way it looked indoors, not outside, but inside, uh, how it looked when people return home from their flood imposed exile. So that was the goal to teach our children's children. And again, the goal is to get the site listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Great. Um, do you know the statistic of how many people in New Orleans died as a result of the hurricane itself and wind, as opposed to the number who perished due to the federal levy failure? Okay, the, the best um, answer to that question can be found in Ezra Boyd's um, dissertation, where he studied that in depth uh, before he died very, very young and tragically at the age of 40. Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's difficult to classify death as from drowning or from trauma after the flooding, but he's done a very, very good job. Uh, and I'm happy to, um, uh, I'm pretty sure I, I cite this, this dissertation in my book, but I'm happy to after, afterward to, to get the full title, Ezra Boyd is the author. Uh, uh, and it, it, it has the word morbidity in the title. Okay, but uh, do I know the statistic? Um, I, I think only God knows the, the real statistic. You know, it, it basically is how you ask the question and how you want to phrase the answer. So 
So, but it, but it's a very good question. It's a fair question. Yeah. Um, and also a question of um, what does levies.org need in the area of volunteers? <laughs> wow. I'm so glad you asked. Um, I, we, one of our most influential and powerful teams is our letter writing team. We have a group of national letter writers uh, who whenever they see wrong information in the media, which still does happen, uh, not in the major leagues, but it still, still does happen, these letter writers write a letter to the editor, you know, correcting the information. And we certainly can, um, we certainly would love um, uh, more writers in that department. And, and other things come up um, as time goes by. Um, and, and I think the best way to find out how you can uh, work with levy.org is to sign up with our mailing list. And we only send about two mailings a month and you, you, you can unsubscribe at any time just by going to levies.org. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, Karen has already found the link to Boyd's dissertation and linked it in the chat for anyone curious. Great investigative work, that was very fast. Um, and some wonderful comments also. Thank you so much for the important work that you've done and are continuing to do. Um, we still have a few more minutes for questions if people want to have anything else burning. I do want to make sure to say if you would like to purchase the book, you can do so through the 1850 House Museum Store, uh, which I will pull up and link to very shortly um, and find more of this information in detail. Give people a few more seconds, Beth. Um, so, um, from Regina, did you collaborate with Andy Horowitz and his book, Katrina, A History? We, he, he and I uh, were very aware of each other's work. He and I have been colleagues for at least 10 years, to my knowledge. Uh, did, did we work together? No, but I've read Andy's book and it, and, and we are very good, you know, we comp our books complement each other. Our books are very different. Uh, Andy looks at the flooding disaster from the standpoint of, you know, sociological, political, um, environmental uh, over a long, long period of time. And my book is pretty much focused between 1985 and, and 2005, 2010. So mine is much tighter. Uh, also, Andy's book is, reads more like a buttoned up academic um, uh, book, whereas mine is, is a, uh, a personal, you know, told through, uh, it talked about my personal um, things I cried about and the things I was happy about. So they're, they're very different, but they uh, complement each other extremely well. I was, I was thrilled when I read Andy's book. And I, I think I wrote the first um, a customer review on Amazon. <laughs> Great book. That's great. Yeah. Um, and I, one last, or no, a couple more questions. Um, so you're just visiting San Francisco was the question. Are you still? Yes, yes. Based I don't live here. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> my my granddaughter thoughts, lives here. That's important. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the New Orleans Sewage and Water Board, given the flooding of the city? Where do you see their role? Notice I take a breath. Uh, Changes were made to the Sewage and Water Board 20, 30 years ago that I seriously wonder if those changes in governance was good for the organization. Often when you get changes in governance and reform, it often happens when um, people aren't paying attention and looking. Uh, things can be called reform when they're not. Um, and that, that's one of the things I'm concerned about with this uh, the current form of the organization, clearly there's problems. Um, I got a, a $14,000 bill uh, from, from my home. Um, thank goodness I opened my, my, my open the, the envelopes every month. There, clearly there's problems everywhere, um, but fixing them is difficult. I personally feel that the, uh, when we had that 
uh, three years ago, the, the, the serious flooding uh, and the current president said it, it blamed the flooding on global warming, that I seriously felt that there should have been more independent examination. You, you hear me say that a lot. There needed to be independent examination and my organization, we begged and pleaded, let us be a part of this, um, of this investigation. And we were, we were, we were told, don't call us, we'll call you. This is the city governance at that time, which was under the Mitch Landrieu administration. So um, I, I am critical, to be honest. I am very critical of, of what's going on. And I've, I've done everything but march down there and, and, and say, move over, I'm coming in. I haven't, haven't taken it to that point yet. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm critical. Okay, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but um, uh, I feel there's a, a lot of, a long, we need to come a long way with the governance of the sewage and water board. That's important to hear, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm not seeing other questions come in, but we've gotten some really wonderful questions and comments throughout the evening. Thank you to everyone who, for your participation and your contributions. Um, and Molly just said, so glad you're on our team, Sandy. Um, and on that note, thank you so much, Sandy, for joining us this evening, for sharing your story and your expertise. Um, and the effort that you have put into this fight throughout the last 15 years. Um, and um, thanks for, for sharing it this evening. Uh, if anybody has any final questions or comments, we'll stick around for another minute or so. Uh, but you will get an email with the recording of this event likely tomorrow, so that if there are parts that you'd like to revisit, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, and please be in touch. We have several other exciting programs coming up in the next month. On September 24th, um, the author Sarah Broom, um, who recently published The Yellow House, which is um, about her family home and and her personal history in the city um, and that home was destroyed in Katrina. We'll be speaking on September 24th in conversation with Leslie Harris and then our next um, second Thursday lecture in October is with Melissa Daggett on spiritualism in 19th century New Orleans. So a little bit of a shift and it'll be a wonderful conversation. So thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Stay safe. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for having me. Should, should I stay a little bit or just to hang on? Um, maybe just a minute. Just sure, sure. I, don't, I don't mind. I can't go outside. <laughs> <laughs> that is really very scary. I'm gonna have to send some tech on. But we know New Orleanians, we're tough. You know, we, we are, we, we, we buckle up. We, so we can do this, we'll get through this, you know, as long as, especially since we have our families around us. I didn't discuss COVID today, but there's so many similarities between what the nation's going through with COVID and what New Orleanians went through with the levee breach event 15 years ago, that the, the, the parallels go on and on. Uh, but the one big difference is at least new, um, the pe people of the nation can sleep in their own bed at night with their own spouses at night. Uh, with, and after the levee broke, many families were separated. Um, many of my friends were separated from their spouses because one had to stay in New Orleans to work. Another had to go to Dallas with the kids. Um, uh, and, and even if you were with your spouse, you weren't in your own house. Nobody. Nope. So. Yeah. Oh, we just got one another question. <laughs> one last question. Any yes. future book plans? I'm sorry, what? You any future book? Oh, um, well, I'll tell you what. It took me five years to write this one. This was my debut uh, book. Um, it, and I had to cut out about two-fifths of my book to, 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 uh, to, to make my publisher happy. So uh, I, I, I would like, I, I have an idea of doing like a how-to, like how to take on a cause and win. Um, because a lot of that had to be cut out. Um, how to recognize um, the, uh, the, the fallacious arguments, um, how to recognize when you're being attacked, um, and, uh, which, which can be veiled, an attack can be hard to recognize what it is. I had to cut all of that out from my book. So 
So yeah, I, I have dreams of like a how-to uh, book uh, one day, which I would love to do. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Um, and about your comment about evacuation and, and those challenges, it's also, I think, important to remember there are many thousands of people right now evacuated to New Orleans, um, mm -hmm. struggling with, with that recovery also in the midst of COVID. So it's, it's, a, it's a scary and difficult time, and it's also a great time for New Orleanians to um, support um, our neighbors, which has been good to see. And we are. We are very proud, very proud of the people of New Orleans. And, yeah. and we got our numbers down, our positivity down, our numbers down. So we're, we're Keep that going. <laughs> remarkable people. <laughs> yes, yes. Hopefully uh, there's good things on the horizon. Yes, hopefully. All right. Well, I think I will go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you so much, Anthony, for your comments in the chat and for attending. You said thank you, enjoyed the book. Um, and thanks to everyone who's still here. Um, Sandy, I'll be in touch again soon, but I want to thank you again. This has been really wonderful. Please You're stay very safe welcome. out there. Stay inside. <laughs> Namaste. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night.